So the original human couple would have had a pristine a set of genomes with none of this a harmful variation or mutational variation. But they right. did, they were, you know, front loaded with all of this amazing uh, variability that what we might call today common, common variants. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Trey, and I have with me today ICR's geneticist, Dr. Jeff Tompkins. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Awesome. Uh, we, we love having you on the show. So today we're going to start, uh, this is actually kind of a two-part series where we're talking about some transitional human forms, uh, supposed links in the human ancestry. And for our audio listeners, I put human evolution in quotes uh, because there's a lot of issues with that. And so these two examples, these two specimens have been pushed forward as like, hey, human evolution, uh, at least sometime in the past. Maybe not now, maybe that they, they don't hold to it as strongly, but for a while they did. Uh, so just overall, do you have anything to say about the concept of human evolution? Yeah, just as kind of a general introduction to the whole concept. Um, there are basically, when you look at all the whole spectrum of hominid fossils, basically there are human-like fossils, and we're going to talk about one of those today, which is Homo erectus. And then you have ape-like fossils, and the primary one of those would be Australopithecus. And you really have nothing in between to bridge that gap. Mm. And in fact, I'm not the only one to recognize that or other creationists, evolutionists have actually stated the very same thing. And in fact, I want to talk about a, just briefly, a paper that was published uh, in the Royal Society. It was a 2016 paper. And listen to the title of this uh, journal article. The title is From Australopithecus to Homo, The Transition That Wasn't. Mm. <laughs> and let me read a quote from the paper. Yeah. Although the transition from Australopithecus to Homo is usually thought of as a momentous transformation, the fossil record bearing on the origin and earliest evolution of Homo is virtually undocumented. There we go. We can just end the podcast right we could, there. <laughs> we could end it right there. But even evolutionists uh, themselves recognize there's a huge gap. It's you know the, the missing link, so to speak. It's still missing. It is still absolutely missing. Okay. Well, as you mentioned a little earlier today, we're going to talk about Homo erectus. Uh, many scientists classify Homo erectus as this transitional form between apes and humans. And uh, there are still others that say Homo erectus is nothing more than a human. So we're going to dig into that, kind of the history of this specimen, where it came from, and the thoughts about it. So... I have a little bit of background information on its discovery. So Eugene Dubois discovered Java Man on the island of Java, uh, and that's in 1891. That's a long time ago. So this is not like a new thing. This is this is talk around this has been going on for a while. My information that I have is that you know he was already a major supporter of Darwin. Um, and he was an anatomist, but that he only found a couple of pieces uh, of this specimen. And then he was like, yep, that's a transitional form. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, this was a period of time right after Darwin had published his uh, material on evolution. And mm -hmm. in fact, Darwin even published a book on human evolution where he theorized that humans evolved from apes. Right. And so Eugene Du Bois was a, a huge fan of Darwin. And uh, he was desperate, as well as other people in the world, to try mm -hmm. and prove Darwin right, right, to try and prove evolution right as, as far as it applied to humans evolving from apes. And so he was uh, very motivated. And uh, so he, yes, he did find these three bones. One was a skull cap, and uh, another was a femur, and I believe a tooth. So basically the skull cap and a, the femur bone were found 50 feet apart, um, but he put everything together anyways and claimed it was one individual based on these three bones. And so that was essentially the first uh, Homo erectus, and that has been dated at 1.9 million years ago by evolutionary reasoning and dating. Okay. 
which is a long time ago. It's a very long time ago, and it's an important number that, that we need to keep in our minds okay. uh, as we move forward. And another interesting thing is, is that this Homo erectus individual was on a remote island in Southeast Asia. So how did they get there? Probably they, they got there in um, some type of boat. <laughs> and they yeah, had that to, would make sense. They had to navigate, you know, over the open ocean to get there. So keep that in mind, too, as, as we move along. So you need some sort of... It, it, just initial thoughts is right. you need some sort of intelligence to make a boat to exactly. get to the island. Well, on, and on top of that, as we'll discuss in a little bit, evolutionists think that modern humans migrated out of Africa about 200,000 years ago. Mm. And although Homo erectus wouldn't be considered anatomically modern, uh, although it, it, in a sense it is, because the features in Homo erectus regarding its its you know, unique features in its skull are still found in living humans today. So, right. And you're referring to things like, you know, uh, pronounced brow ridge right. and, and things like that, which I, I think pop culture has, has done a disservice because they make, you know, they're like, Oh, look at this caveman. Right. And then they give them those kinds of features. And then, but it's like, people have those features today. Exactly. And, but then they'll add these, these soft tissue features. Um, they're complete, made up make-believe stuff like a flattened ape-like nose mm. well that doesn't preserve as a fossil only bone does right so we don't know and so they yeah they kind of make these these homo erectus uh pieces of art look more ape-like based on their evolutionary presuppositions but when you look at the basic bone structure uh, of the skull those features are still present in in modern humans and in fact you know, one of the most famous individuals is uh, Nikolai Valuev, who is a professional boxer um, in Russia. And um, I've got a picture of him in one of my articles. Maybe you can put that up. Pop it up on the screen right now. It, actually, it's a side profile, and he has a sloping forehead, a huge brow ridge. Uh, and the man is alive and well today, and he's a pretty smart guy because he's now in the Russian parliament. So... Um, but anyways, he has these very archaic features as well as other people as well. I actually do a presentation where I show a rugby players uh, from Europe with mm -hmm. the same features with sloping foreheads and huge brow, brow ridges. So, so these features are still found in modern humans. Just genetic diversity. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, Peking Man um, discovered quite a bit later, uh, 1923 and 1937 discovered between there uh, near Beijing. So uh, we're we've left Java. We're right. on uh, somewhere completely different. Um, and I, I see that this is dated at 680 to 780 thousand years old, which is much younger uh, than than the uh, Java man. Uh, so we, but it looks like there are more pieces here. It's not just three. There's there's a bunch. What's right. going on there? Well, it's kind of the same theme. Uh, the, the skulls are, I would say, Neanderthal-like. In other words, they have the, the huge brow ridge and uh, the sloping forehead. And so it's, it's just more uh, Homo erectus-like features. But yes, you're, you're correct on the dating. The dating is definitely about a, a million years less yeah. um, than the Java man. And so these dates are actually all import, you know, important to to put together this picture and how it doesn't make any evolutionary sense. So, right. yeah, so that would be the second major uh, Homo erectus finding. And, uh, and they also found uh, stone tools and regular, like we'll say modern human skulls at the same, at the same place. Which, yes, eventually. Right. They did. Um, so I, I don't know. So I, I, I'm picturing like Java man. Okay. He needed a boat of some sort. Right. And then we see Peking Man, which clearly used stone tools of some sort. So this doesn't, to me, sound like a brute. It's, you know, like some sort of caveman. It sounds like an intelligent being. Right. Okay. All right. So then we move from China. Uh, there's similar skulls found in Africa. Uh, the most complete... Uh, Homo erectus fossil I see is Turkana boy discovered near Lake Turkana in Kenya, uh, 1984, uh, 1.6 million years old. Uh, he's about 10 to 12 years old. 
Uh, so that that's different than the others because this is this is a youth, right? Well, it's not only a youth, um, but it's a very almost a complete skeleton. So okay. the, the feet are missing. There's some finger bones, but the hands are largely missing. But the rest of the skeleton is pretty complete. It, it's probably the most complete Homo erectus fossil that that we have. And what's very interesting is the entire skeleton, outside of the the unique features in the skull, uh, was the same as a, a, a modern human. Right. And they, evolutionists would say it's an anatomically modern human. So, so the entire skeleton below the, um, the cranium was just like any other modern human. And in okay. fact, what's interesting is that based on uh, the size of the skeleton, and of course they determined the youth of the skeleton as well, that when this individual became a full-grown man, he would have been about six feet tall. Okay. So he would have been a sizable in, you yeah. know, individual, not some yeah. little ape-like creature. So, well, plus his skeleton was essentially anatomically modern, except for the the sloping forehead and and, uh, and the, brow the, the brow ridge, and which so, are, again are things that we see today. Yeah, right. So if you see that kind of a skull with that kind of a, a connected to that kind of a skeleton, it just tells you it's just nothing more than a modern human. Plus, we see these these skull traits in, in modern humans today, anyway. So right. Essentially, yeah, it was it was basically a a pristine example of a nearly complete a skeleton of a Homo erectus that basically showed it was fully human. Okay, all right. So then we we have some examples here of of a Homo erectus. Uh, I see we have we found some more recently, early two thousands, uh, the Black and Caspian Sea fossils, uh, although they are controversial. Well, they're controversial because the the skulls, some of the skulls were really strange looking. In fact, they look like they met, there might have been some kind of pathology, developmental pathology going on there. And in fact, the evolutionists were kind of shocked. And they they probably would have placed each one into a different species, not a different, you know, not necessarily non-human, but right. maybe a different race or <laughs> species of human, as they would say. Because they were so different from each other, but they okay. were definitely, you know, human uh, skulls. But the reason uh, they put them all together is because they were found very close to one another and in the same uh, stratigraphic layer. So, okay. so they believe that they were all uh, from one community. Okay. All right. So then we've got our examples of, of Homo erectus. So what is, what is the trait here that ties all these together? What, what makes... What caused uh, the scientists who, who dug all these up and put them together, what caused them to all lump them together into this, uh, this person, we'll say, uh, Homo erectus? Yeah, I would say it's primarily because of the, the skull okay. morphology that they saw in these, uh, which was actually very similar to Neanderthal. Okay. Uh, only the difference is that Neanderthals had much bigger Craniums. In fact, the Neanderthal craniums, uh, although they had sloping foreheads, large, large brow ridge, small chin, uh, they were much bigger okay. than modern humans. Uh, whereas the Homo erectus skulls were were still within the range of modern human skull capacity or brain capacity, but they were at the lower end. Okay. But it, they were well within the the range. What's that considered we, normal? Absolutely. Right. Okay. So we have these skull features that in here we'll we'll put up a picture of a Homo erectus skull here, uh, and so it's this th these pieces these features are what is causing uh, everyone to say, look, this is a human ancestor. It's a one point whatever million years old, although we have some that are less than you know less than a million. Uh, according to their time frame. Well, actually, we have a, a series of findings um, that I'd like to talk about sure. that were dated at very uh, recent evolutionary times that okay. were Homo erectus-like. Okay, well, before we get there, I'm going to interrupt you. It is time for our random science question of the day. Okay, are you ready? I'm for ready. This? You're ready? All right. This is, this is going to be a controversial one. So whatever you answer, I'm taking it as, as that's the answer. Should scientists manipulate genetics for health purposes? I think about like CRISPR or whatever that's called, where they can go in and like, so 
some people are like, you shouldn't ever mess with genetics because that's wrong. Uh, some people are like, well, if it's for the benefit of, you know, your health, you should. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the CRISPR CAS uh, technology is uh, basically, you know, to simplify it or oversimplify, <laughs> oversimplify it. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a cut and paste type system. So it was actually discovered in bacteria and uh, the bacteria used it as a defense mechanism against viruses. And in fact, they would record the, the memory of a virus uh, infection through this system. And then you, and the system was also used to uh, provide immunity to the bacteria at, you know, in a, in a memory type function later on. Okay. So, but anyways, it's a very interesting system. You can essentially uh, target a section of the genome and, and replace it. And it's kind of crazy. Yeah, kinda it crazy is kind of crazy. And um, what's it, of course, this technology has a lot of implications for people that want to do really evil stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of countries around the world that are not very well regulated as far as genome manipulation, especially uh, when it comes to humans. Okay. And so who knows what's really going on in, in other parts of the world like China and in places that there's no regulation on this. And of course the regulations on this in amongst humans uh, in the Western world is also slipping away as well. So. My main concern is that, that this is going to be used for, for nefarious, uh, evil purposes. And as most people know, you really can't trust the government. Right. <laughs> we live in a sin-cursed, uh, fallen world. Yeah. And people that don't have Christ are going to be doing uh, things that are not good. So yeah. that would probably be my main concern. Okay. Yes, it, it does have uh, some applications. It can perhaps you know help with correcting... Uh, things like diabetes and, and other traits in humans where you could literally target a specific organ with the, the delivery vector, which would be um, a virus mm -hmm. that would target a certain organ and then replace uh, a section of the genome in that, the, the cells of that organ, and perhaps correct something like diabetes. That's um, crazy. So, that, yeah, there is yeah. potential for that. Uh, whether that's something we ought to be doing or, or not, um, I don't know. I'm still kind of thinking about that myself. Yeah. Uh, to be quite honest with you, but I'm probably more concerned about the misuse uh, the misuse yeah. of this technology. Right. Now, this technology can also be used for basic research, and in fact, a lot of molecular biology labs are now using this technology to to just do basic research on cells that are growing in petri dishes, essentially. Or, and so they're 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 using it. Um, just to develop a basic knowledge. And so I have no problem with, with that kind of thing. Right. Uh, with the technology itself. It, right. Well, with the technology itself and using it for just studying, you know, how systems work in the, right. in the cell. So, you know, that, yeah. So, so I think it's great for that. But my concern is uh, what, what nefarious uh, people and individuals and organizations might be doing with it. I mean, it's kind of like the internet, right? Right. It, it, it's a it's a tool. It can be used right. for good things, and it can be used for bad. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for answering my random science question of the day. I know that uh, our comments are going to be full of people that are going to say things like "you should never do that," and people who are like, oh, "if it's good for health, go for it," you know, uh, and that's okay. People are entitled to their opinion, right? So. All right, we'll get back to uh, the topic at hand. Okay, so we were talking about these old Homo erectus finds up to uh, almost 2 million years ago, uh, and then some that are not quite as old. Um, but before the random science question of the day, that there were some that were even more recent. Uh, can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of uh, discoveries in different parts of the world that you know, for the most part, have been swept under the rug. And yes, okay. papers were published in, in, you know, regular evolutionary journals and channels, but but these findings are largely uh, ignored because okay. of what's, <laughs> what's known as a dating issue. And so let's talk about the cow swamp bones, which were found in 1972 in Australia. So that's not recent. That's, you know, those were found a while ago, right? Right, uh, right in the early 70s. And um, so essentially they were aboriginal type, 
type bones. But they were they were very Homo erectus like. In other words, they they were no different than other Homo erectus fossils. They had the sloping forehead, the large brow ridge, the small chin. Okay. You know the basic features, but they were dated at ten thousand years old, which in evolutionary time is is a blink of the eye. You right. know, that's that's like nothing. So, so that doesn't fit with our one point six million year old fossils in China, the one point nine million year old fossils in Java. Mm -hmm. So what's up? So here's some Homo erectus fossils, but they're only dated by evolutionists at ten thousand years. Yeah, and so. But we have another important finding as well. And these were some Mongolian bones. They're found in Mongolia uh, in 2006, which isn't that long ago. And these were dated at 34,000 years old. Okay. Once again, this is, this is not fitting with this Homo erectus uh, narrative that's, you know, one plus million years old. And so... What makes these even more interesting, not only that they were dated at, at 34,000 years old, but they extracted DNA oh. from these bones. Okay. And they found out that it was it basically was human DNA of uh, a Eurasian origin. So in other words, which fits to, as to where, <laughs> where they were found in Mongolia. Right. You would expect, you know, the human DNA in that region to be Eurasian. So... Anyways, once again, this contradicts the narrative that, that the Homo erectus is one plus million years old. And so, and, but it fits with the narrative that it's just another type of human. Right. Because these features are still, you know, still here, still here with, so with modern humans. G genetic variety, it's right? It's just genetic variation, okay. right? And do we know... I guess uh, maybe we don't, but do we know if there's any sort of like culture that we know of or like i mean at the very least they use tools right because they found stone tools yeah um, you know that's very interesting in fact i want to read a list of of human-like uh, attributes that they have connected with homo erectus uh, okay. fossils and finds in fact it's it's a somewhat long list but i think it's worth it's worth we'll mentioning we'll bullet point these uh, and this the is just name. yeah this is a bullet point uh, type list so in connection with Homo erectus fossils, they have found watercraft construction and seafaring navigation, okay. language and communication skills. In other words, the various bones and features of the anatomy uh, for language, human language, and communication are all present. Jewel jewelry manufacture. So in other words, these creatures had a sense of beauty and wanted to, to wear jewelry and to look nice. Uh, cordage and knot making, which is a complicated uh, skill, skill yeah. to have. The manufacture and use of sophisticated stone and bone tools. The controlled usage of fire and cooking. So okay. anytime you have something that's <laughs> making fire, it's probably going to be human. Yeah. Because no, nothing in the animal kingdom goes out there and makes fires. Right. The Also, the catching and processing of fish, in other words, not only catching the fish, but preserving it so it'll last and you can store it and eat it later. The development of organized living and occupational spaces. In other words, they were building uh, dwellings uh, okay. with, with specific rooms and just like modern humans would do. Uh, art, there, there's petroglyphs, figurines, red ochre paint. Uh, once again, the, that sense of beauty and uh, which you only see amongst humans doing those sorts of things. Woodworking, coordinated large game hunting and processing, development of clothing from animal skins, development of fibers and resins, social and family structure, and care for the elderly okay. and the weak. So It just sounds like humans. It's just human activity. Okay. All right. Well, then... Well, let me say something real quick. Okay. Because... You know, the whole paradigm um, in the evolutionary community is is, is always evolving, right. <laughs> if you will, especially when it comes to uh, hominids. So a lot of evolutionists now are, are calling Homo erectus archaic humans. Okay. Which in is other words, they're not, they e are. they're not even putting them in to necessarily a, a transitional uh, state. It's just an archaic human. Um, mm. Or it's just a branch of the human tree or... Kind of like the Neanderthals are now called archaic humans as well, because now we know that they fully bred with modern humans. They found uh, Neanderthal uh, burial sites that had 
both Neanderthal type skulls, modern uh, anatomically modern human skulls buried with them, and everything in between. Right. So in other words, they were interbreeding, and it was just human variation. Okay. Just human genetic variation, which we still see all over the world today. Okay, so if these uh, people, I mean, they're, they're humans, so let's just call them what they are. If these humans uh, that have been given the name uh, Homo erectus, uh, if they were different enough genetically from what we would consider a modern human, that they were placed in a different category, at least at the time, where where does that genetic variation come from? Uh, what why did this particular people group have these distinct features or why did they develop them, et cetera? Right. So, you know, all of the, the variation we see in humans today is, um, is either common variation or what's called common variants, uh, which I believe as well as other creation scientists believe was built into the original ancestral human couple, Adam and Eve. Okay. So these are common variants, and genetically speaking, you know, we they've been mapping these for the last twenty years all over the world in human genomes in, in every people group, nearly every people group you can think of. And then there's also you know, there is a mutational variation, and in fact, several studies were published uh, in 2012 showing that most of that was actually associated with uh, bad stuff. In other words, eighty percent of those rare variants. Um, especially those in, in what are the protein coding regions of the genome. Mm -hmm. 80% of those were associated with, with uh, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, things like that. So, gotcha. so you do have this mutational variation building up you know, over time as well. So the original human couple would have had a pristine a set of genomes with none of this a harmful variation or mutational variation, but they right. did, they were you know, front loaded with all of this amazing uh, variability that what we might call today common common variants. But you have to remember that about 2,000 years after creation, there was a global flood, and then the Earth was repopulated um, with three ancestral couples. And actually, um, uh, Nathaniel Jensen, who is a creation scientist, has actually mapped out a lot of this variation based on uh, genome sequences from around the world, from the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial genome. And he has basically shown that, that basically there's essentially three main groups uh, of genetic variants, which makes sense because that traces back to Noah's three sons and their wives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because the Y chromosome is, is a, a male chromosome, and then you have the mitochondrial uh, genome, which is inherited maternally. So, so that's been some really interesting research that's confirmed uh, the fact that the world was repopulated uh, by three couples after the flood. So, so where do we get all the variation in people groups now? Well, the Tower of Babel uh, occurred shortly after the flood, and that's where humans disobeyed God to go out and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to, to stay in one place and recreate their pre-flood pagan empire, I suppose. Uh, and they made a huge uh, pagan structure, the Tower of Babel, uh, which is pretty common uh, for, you know, we see these type of structures all over the world in Egypt and, you know, South America, South America, uh, Central, type, these pyramid yeah. type things, even yeah. in China. So yeah. we're assuming that's the, that's the kind of structure they built. But anyways, to make a long story short, God uh, basically intercepted their, their wicked plans to stay in one place. And they only had one language at that point in time. And so God confused uh, the languages of the people. So if you're going to uh, marry someone and have children, you're probably going to do it with someone you can communicate with or talk to. And so we instantly have all of these, these genetic um, people groups being created just because of the fact that's who they could communicate with and start a family with. And so that's why we have all these people groups around the world and all this variation uh, around the world. And, you know, we have a huge mix of variation, yeah, huge mix of traits, and they show up in different combinations, you know, around the world. Uh, for an example, there's a people group in Northern Europe that where they have blonde hair, blue eyes, 
uh, but they have Asian eyes. Um, and of course, you know, the Asian eyes are very common in, in different parts of Asia, but, and also people in Africa have, have a similar, they have dark skin, uh, but yet they have these Asian eyes. And so, so we see all these combinations of traits showing up around the world, but it's because of the Tower of Babel. But uh, another question I have is, you know, some of these, these findings that we're seeing, like uh, Turkana Boy, you know, where did that come from? Was that post-flood or was that pre-flood? Mm. Now, it may be that some of these findings uh, of, of these uh, Homo erectus fossils that we find in sediments, now I'm not talking about stuff that's ri ritually buried in caves, right. but looks like it was deposited in some sediment. Maybe that was late flood. Because okay. a lot of people will say, where are all the humans, you know, that got buried in the flood. Well, we know they would have been buried last right? at the very, very top layers because they, they're intelligent. They would have been escaping to higher ground. The flood was a progressive event over, that took place over a year. And uh, so humans would have been basically essentially heading for higher ground. Maybe they had boats and things they were trying to escape uh, with. And so you wouldn't have a whole lot of human fossils for that reason, but the ones that you would find would probably be buried in the uppermost sediment. So right. that makes sense. I think that the Pleistocene, which is, which is on top of most of the, the flood sediments, I think some of the lower layers of, of the Pleistocene may have actually been flood, flood sediments. Uh, we, you know, most of the Pleistocene is, is unconsolidated rock and it's obvious it was, uh, after the flood and deposited, you know, during uh, the ice age, which we've had in other podcasts and talked right. about with Dr. Hebert. So yes. we'll link that right here. Yeah. but I, yeah. So I think there are some instances where uh, some of these um, fossils that are Homo erectus or even anatomically modern humans uh, that have been buried uh, in a sediment, not in a cave situation, um, you know, maybe late late flood uh, burials. So, wow. but um, a lot of Homo erectus fossils and Neanderthal fossils that we find ritually buried in caves, uh, I believe those are post flood. Right. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, otherwise they'd be right. washed out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So. so, so anyways, there's a lot of interesting aspects to this, but definitely the bottom line is Homo erectus was, was fully human and just a variant of the human um, kind, if you will. Okay. Of course, you know, humans, the Bible doesn't say that there is a, a human kind. It says humans were created in the image of God. Right. And all the different types of trees and animals and things recreate after their kind. But, and of course, we know humans recreate <laughs> only after their kind as right. well. But what's unique is that humans were created in, in the image of God so that they could have fellowship uh, with God. And of course, that was broken when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And, um, and then sin and a curse entered into creation, and that's why we see all the evil and all the disease, all the suffering that we do in the world now. Right. But uh, praise God, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us uh, from our sins. And if we give our lives to him and believe in him, uh, we will be saved. Absolutely. And uh, on, on top of that, you know, that is just we have such like a, a push today to kind of like separate people. Right. You know, there, there is like this, like, Oh, um, you know, I, we're very insular in this very individualistic society, but this just, you know, this just these homo erectus fossils that are just human show that, you know, we've been human from the beginning. We are just, there's just one, humankind created in the image of God. Right, exactly. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, before we close, I always like to ask, have you heard any like bad creationist arguments uh, in regard to Homo erectus? You know, sometimes we hear like, you know, we use an argument from the 70s that, you know, we just know isn't necessarily true today. Is there anything uh, along this line that you would say, hey, don't use that argument anymore? No, I would say the general consensus among uh, creation scientists um, is that Homo erectus um, is just a variant of the humankind. And I think that's always generally been the case in over the past 30, 40 years. 
And so, no, I don't see a whole lot of, you know, deviant uh, opinions about that that, right. that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and what's really interesting, that sort of parallel, you know, parallels what the evolutionary community is saying, that now Homo erectus are just archaic humans. Yeah. We got to the answer first. Yeah, right? yeah. well, yeah, you, you might you might be able to say that, that creationists yeah. basically had that consensus before uh, the evolutionary community did. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for being here. Do you have any final closing thoughts for our viewers and listeners? No, I don't, but I have a very good article, and okay. maybe you can... Uh, yeah, we'll link it. ...put that up on yeah. uh, the internet. It's called Homo erectus, the ape man that wasn't. Okay. And... I cover pretty much everything that we talked about today uh, and more. in this article and more with a lot more facts and figures and things. So okay. all the numbers. Yes, all the numbers that are <laughs> got a, kind remember. of hard to keep straight when you're doing a podcast. Yeah. So, so yes, good. they're all in there, and I would I would recommend reading that. We'll do absolutely. We'll, we'll link that. Well, again, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us for this episode of the Creation Podcast. Um, we will have a second one that's on uh, another supposed transitional f fossil that'll be next podcast and if you want to see that early uh, make sure to become a member or a patron uh, the links are in the description down below uh, at a certain tier you do get uh, the creation podcast a week early and you get creation.live two weeks early so that's uh great and uh we just encourage you to share this with your friends with your family uh like subscribe do all that good uh youtube shenanigans you know the drill all right uh we'll see you next time on the creation podcast we want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons if you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.